we have seen that when we begin to observe the human being, we approach some riddles of the universe, since we can see in the human being's twofold form something of the solution of the world riddle. Meditating about all these things, we are helped by the formula. The world as a totality is a riddle, and the human being also taken as a totality is its solution. We must not, however, expect to solve the world riddle in a moment, human life itself in its entirety, what we experience between birth and death and again between death and birth, that is the solution of the world riddle. So this is a very serviceable formula. The world is a riddle and the human being is its solution. We have seen that when we regard the external human physical form, we can distinguish between the head part and the remaining part. We can consider the head part in its spherical form as an image of the whole cosmos, not just by way of comparison but in actuality. We can truly say that the whole starry heaven is involved in bringing about the form, the shaping, the inner forces of the human head. Of course, it is also true, speaking lightly, that everyone has a unique head, certainly each human being does. For as you know, the configuration of the place and time of a person's birth results in each person having a unique head according to the position of the stars in the heavens. Let us keep in mind that our head is not built up by the starry heaven in general, but by its specific configuration. And from various studies we realize that a considerable part of the human being's task between death and rebirth is to become familiar with the mysteries, the spiritual secrets of the stars. <clears throat> One can even say that in a certain sense the head is not given us passively, but that we make it ourselves. Between death and the next birth we come to know all the laws that prevail in wide cosmic space. In fact, when we think of it spiritually, the wide universe is our home between death and a new birth. And just as here on earth we learn to know the laws by which houses and other things are constructed, so in the time between death and rebirth we become familiar with the laws of the cosmos. And from the cosmos, together with the purely spiritual beings who dwell there, we work chiefly upon the head. So when the human head appears in the physical world, it only appears to be determined solely by heredity from one's ancestors. I have said repeatedly that everyone acknowledges that the magnetic pole in the needle does not turn by itself to the north and the other pole to the south, but that cosmic forces are at work, namely that the earth is exercising its influence. In the case of the magnet, people admit that the universe plays a part, but when we come to the origin of the human being, they are not yet willing to acknowledge that the whole universe participates. In the case of the human being, the whole universe is concerned with the formation of the head. The head has not merely been shaped by heredity from father, mother, grandparents, and so on, but by forces from the whole universe acting within it. Principally through the limbs and members, the configuration of cosmic forces acts upon the content of the head. On the other hand, in so far as the rest of our organism is physical, we do receive it through a kind of hereditary transmission from generations of ancestors. Modern natural science is very close to discovering this from its own standpoint. Actually, the natural science of today combats only those parts of the truth that are suggestive of spiritual science. But a meeting between natural and spiritual science is very near on many points. I have said in other lectures and indicated here that natural science is on the verge of discovering something that has met with skepticism, even in spiritual circles. People who read my title, Theosophy, find themselves repelled by the chapter about the human aura, by the way an individual's forces of soul and spirit are expressed for clairvoyance in a color aura that sparkles around them. Professor Moritz Benedict, whom I have often mentioned in other connections, has recently made experiments in Vienna with gifted dowsers. Professor Benedict did not make experiments about clairvoyance, since he has not the least been interested in acknowledging clairvoyance. But he has made experiments in a dark room with gifted dowsers, who have played such an important role in this war. <laughs> since water was needed for soldiers, people with a gift for using divining rods were assigned to various army units, 
especially in the southern battle zones, to help find water. Of course, driven by necessity, one had to do such things. Now, in the camera obscura and with the methods of natural science, Professor Benedict has examined people who can find water or metals under the earth by means of the divining rod. In the case of one woman, who was quite small, Benedict discovered that treatment in the camera obscura showed her to have an immense aura, so immense that she looked like a giant. Benedict could even describe the right side as bluish, the left side as yellowish-red. This can all be read today as scientific findings, since Professor Benedict has published the whole matter in his book on the divining rod. What has been observed by Professor Benedict is the aura. It is not the aura as we understand it. We mean by the word much more spiritual elements than this most inferior, almost physical aura, which Professor Benedict is able to find by natural means in the camera obscura. Still, there is a connection. Precisely that part of my book, Theosophy, which has met with the most opposition and abuse, has thus been found to have points of contact with ordinary science. Things will move quickly. It will be the same with regard to the matters I have just touched upon. In a short time, and based purely on natural scientific research, it will be possible to establish that what and individuality bears within itself as inherited from ancestors is not the form of the head, and not the head's inner forces, and that the head is in fact produced by forces in the cosmos. If we went by our heads alone, we should never be nationalistic. The head is not in the least fitted for nationalism, for it is derived from the heavens, and the heavens are not nationalistic. Any division into groups does not come from the head. It comes from that element through which we are connected with the hereditary stream of humanity. This, of course, plays into the head when the human being lives here, between birth and death, for the rest of the organism is continuously exchanging its nerve forces and its blood forces with the head. When we speak of heredity, however, and say that the other non-head part of the human being received its force from the ancestors, we must refer only to the physical element, for the spiritual aspects of that remaining organism are another matter again. It is very important, therefore, for us to consider a fact which can be brought to light only through spiritual science. Natural science will discover, as it has discovered the aura, that the head is influenced through heredity only by being attached to the rest of the organism, that people are, o- are only related to their ancestors by other parts of their organism. This too will be discovered by natural science. But we touch here upon another field which natural science cannot enter forthwith. Inasmuch as we are born, we bear in our head the forces of the universe. They shape our head. A little of that, to be sure, can be substantiated outwardly. Anyone who observes children's development will perhaps know that in the very early days people often ask whom the child resembles, and the likeness often only comes out strongly in later childhood. Some of you will have noticed that. This is due to the fact that the head is mainly neutral as regards earth conditions. The rest of the organism must first affect the head, which of course can happen already at the embryonic stage, and then the features and so on may show a likeness to the ancestors. If one has any feeling for such things, it is possible to see externally the truth of this. But the matter goes deeper. Between the spiritual universe for the universe is filled with spirit and spirit beings, and the earth on which we dwell is a restless go-between, a subtle substance which cannot be produced in the chemistry lab, since it does not belong to the chemical elements, streams in continuously onto the earth out of the universe. If one wants to think of it schematically, one can say the earth is here in universal space, Universal matter continuously streams in from all sides toward the earth, a fine universal substance that even penetrates a little below the earth's surface. So this continually takes place. Substances from the whole of cosmic space rain down toward the earth. It is not physical substance, not a chemical element, but actually spiritual auric substance that sinks down below the surface of the earth. When we come down to earth from the spiritual world to find a place in a human body, we use the forces that lie in this substance. 
Now, it is significant that this substance, streaming into the earth and out again, is used by the human being at death. The human being uses this substance in order to regain its forces prior to returning to the spiritual world. This substance, which I have shown coming inward toward the earth, enters the surface to a certain depth and then streams out again. So one can actually perceive a sort of inhalation of ether or auric substance into the earth and again an exhalation. The following observation is not very easy to make, but if one has observed it once, if one has realized that the earth actually inhales and exhales spiritual substance continuously, then one knows how to apply it in all circumstances, and above all to human life in the way I have just described. <clears throat> Thus we come into our bodily nature with what I have drawn as inwardly directed arrows, and we pass out in death with those pointing outward. In this case I will point out how I came upon this fact years ago. The forces that play here, the inflow and outflow of forces, are not concerned solely with human life, but with every possible kind of earthly condition. The problem for me was how matters stood with cockchafers. Yes, cockchafers of all things. Actually, cockchafers are extraordinarily interesting, because as you may know, when there are many cockchafers in a year, then three or five years later there are very many grubs. They're larvae. These larvae affect the potato crops very seriously. Many grubs mean a very bad crop. Anyone who has anything to do with potato culture knows that there will be a bad crop three or five years after a year in which there are many cockchafers. I had looked into that as an interesting fact, and then I discovered that the life of the cockchafers is connected with the substance flowing in and the life of the grub with the substance flowing out. I only stress this as a way of showing you how one comes upon things from very different angles. One is most certain to come upon things when one is not observing something as the direct object of one's attention, but as a relatively indifferent object, toward which one can most easily maintain a neutral attitude. <clears throat> you see, however, that the substances of which I have spoken penetrate the earth and remain there for a while. The substance that streams in one year only streams out several years later. This is also connected with the fact that the substance flowing out is on the whole heavier than the substance flowing in. The latter is more active, streams in faster. The substance streaming out is heavier and flows more slowly. Intensive observation of human life shows how the human being uses the forces of the incoming substance when emerging from the universe at birth. In subsequent years the connection is lost. You will have realized from what I have said that it is the head which is chiefly affected by the substances flowing in. But the human head is a hard globe. It is indeed a hard globe, and of all the organs the most ossified. Thus the head loses its connection with the inflowing forces relatively early, not in childhood, but relatively early. Hence its formation and development are finished early. The human being remains connected with these forces throughout childhood and then they cease influencing the person, at least in our cosmic cycle. It was not always so on earth, as I will come to presently, but it is so now. Now while the person lives here on earth, the rest of the organism, that is the part that is not the head, takes possession of the substances flowing out and of their forces. The remaining part of the organism imbues itself with them, and these are the forces which help the organism's rejuvenation from without, as I indicated yesterday. They are the rejuvenating forces that act upon the etheric body and make the etheric more and more chubby-faced while we are growing old physically. <clears throat> In case people wonder what I mean by chubby-faced, I will remark that the cheeks of children have the rounded quality that we see for instance, on the faces of musician angels in pictures. In other words, to the extent that the human being is an etheric being, it grows a round, chubby child's face. In this process undergone by the etheric body, in connection with the remaining organism, the forces streaming out of the earth are operative, and it is these same forces which we use when we go through the portal of death to return to the cosmos, the spiritual world. The earth, as you see, has a share in our life, is inwardly involved in it. And something else yet is connected with it, 
which can very easily be made into a formula, an important essential formula. We live for a long time as souls between death and rebirth, before entering the physical world again through birth, and we live as souls again after passing through the portal of death to return to the cosmos, to the spiritual world, until our next incarnation. The dead live a spiritual life, and this life is connected with the stars, just as here on earth we are connected with physical matter. Since our head has been formed and shaped by the forces that influenced us between death and new birth, since we built our head as it were out of cosmic forces, our own real being of soul and spirit finds its spiritual grave in our head relatively early. We possess the head forces that we have here on earth because our head is actually the grave of our soul life as we led it before birth or before conception. Our head is the grave of our spiritual existence. But inasmuch as we come down to earth, the rest of our organism is used to resurrect us, for it takes up the forces which stream from the earth into universal space in order to form its spiritual element. And while our physical organism falls away from us, our spiritual part with our forces that stream out from the earth passes through cosmic space into spirit existence. This is the wonderful polarity that prevails in the universe regarding the human being. We become physical out of the spirit, burying our spirit nature in the head. The head is the end of our spiritual existence before birth. Here upon earth it is reversed. We leave the physical behind. The physical disintegrates gradually during our life and the spiritual arises. Therefore we can say, the birth denotes the resurrection of the physical. The spiritual birth, excuse me, the spiritual being changed into the physical, while death denotes the birth of the spiritual, the physical being given over to the earth, just as the spiritual is handed over to the universe at our birth. We give our spiritual element to the universe by being born, and by dying we hand over to the universe our physical element, by giving our spiritual part to the universe, we are physical human beings. By giving our physical part to the earth through death, we are spiritual human beings in the period between death and the new birth. That is the polarity, the contrast. And our life here consists in developing our spirit organism. But we can develop it in the right way for our present earthly cycle only when what I said yesterday is taken into consideration. That is to say, when we reach the point where both members of human nature enter into correspondence with one another, when head life and heart life enter into correspondence with one another, and the shorter head life really stretches itself out by coming to life in the whole being. Thus the whole human being can be rejuvenated during the lifetime, when in fact the head has long since lost its mobility, its power of inner development. The special task of future pedagogy will be to make anthroposophical spiritual science so fruitful that people come to feel how we are built up out of the cosmos, how the person literally peels off from the cosmos and gives back to the cosmos what was acquired on earth. This education must be imparted through all sorts of narratives, all sorts of things which are adapted to young people, but so adapted that one can retain one's interest for the things learned through every age of life. I ask of you only not to think through, for that is not much use, but to feel through, thoroughly to feel through one thing. Here, too, you see, is a point where modern natural science is already concerning itself with the matters investigated by spiritual science. I have mentioned how intelligent geologists have expressed the view that the earth is already dying out. The earth has already passed its midlife as earth being. In the excellent book by Edward Seuss, titled The Face of the Earth, the purely materialistic geologist Seuss states that when one walks over fields today and looks at the clods of earth, one is dealing with something that is dying out, that was once thriving. It is dying. The earth is dying. We know this from spiritual science, since we know that the earth will be translated into another planetary existence, which we call the Jupiter existence. Thus the earth as such is dying away. But the human being, that is the human race as some of spiritual beings, does not die with the earth. 
Humanity lives beyond the earth as it has lived before the earth was earth, as I described in my title Occult Science, and so on. And so one can permeate oneself with the feeling, again, not the thought, but the feeling, the experience, with the conception, quote, I stand here on this earthly soil, but the ground on which I stand, in, in which I shall find my grave, has but a short appearance in the cosmos, unquote. <clears throat> How then does a next earth, a new planet, arise out of this earth? And how can a new humanity of the future dwell on it? How does it arise? It arises through the fact that we ourselves, piece by piece, carry what is needed to form this new planetary existence. We, human beings, the animal kingdom is also involved to some extent, inasmuch as we always carry within us something belonging to the next life are already here and now, in the course of this, our earth physical life, preparing the next planet that will follow the earth's existence. What is to be the future of the earth resides in the forces that return to the cosmos. We do not, merely, we do not live merely in the present, we live in the future of the earth, but we have to keep returning into incarnation to complete unfinished business on earth as long as earth exists. But we are involved in the future life of the earth. We have said that the earth breathes spirit substance. In the substances that are breathed in we carry the past, the laws of the past, the forces of the past. In what is breathed out, given back, we bear what belongs to the future. In the human race itself lies the future of earth's existence. Think of all this in a really fecund way, with feeling and warmth instead of all the stupid drivel which is imparted to the young these days. Think of this brought to life in hundreds and hundreds of vivid narrations and parables, and brought to the young. Think what a feeling to the universe would be aroused, what there is to do, what there is to be done if our civilization is to go forward, how much there is to do concretely. This is very important, and it can be considered all the more so, since it is connected with what I called the rejuvenation of the human being. The fact that present humanity has come to such a calamitous pass is connected with the fact that it has lost the secret of changing head life into heart life. We have hardly any real heart life. What people generally speak of as such is the life of instincts and desires, merely that, not the spiritual element of which I have spoken. Today people allow whatever is streaming out of the earth to just stream out. They don't bother themselves about it. They pay no attention. Some individuals instinctively are concerned. I recently gave an example of the different ways in which individuals take things into account. <clears throat> I related the example of Professors Zeller and Michelet. I said that I spoke with Edward von Hartmann about the two men just when Zeller had obtained his pension, no longer feeling able at 72 to hold his lectures at the university. But Michelet was ninety-three years old, and Hartmann related that Michelet had just been there and told Hartmann, I don't understand Seller, who is only seventy-two, and saying he cannot go on lecturing, I am ready to lecture for another ten years. And with that Michelet skipped about the room and gleefully planned what he would lecture about the next year, and couldn't imagine how that, how that lad, Seller, the seventy-two-year-old Seller, could have put, on, put in a claim to be pensioned off. This keeping young is connected with exchanges between the head and the heart. This can happen in single individuals, but on the whole it can occur even in single individuals only if it becomes part of our whole civilization, if our whole cultural life becomes imbued with the principle that it should have not just head life but heart life as well. But you see, to acquire heart life requires more patience. Despite the fact that it is more creative, more youth-giving, Still, heart life requires more patience. Head life, well, one sits down and crams, and when we are young we prefer to stick to our cramming, despite all our teacher's admonitions. For some customs have survived from the ancient past when things were still known out of atavism, but people no longer know how to interpret these customs. I shall remind you of one. <clears throat> all the things that have been preserved from the relatively recent past, before materialism had become generalized, have a deeper meaning. For instance, in recent decades, 
The habit has been lost, but when I was young, it is some time ago, there was an arrangement in the grammar school, in the lower school, it was in the second class, to have ancient history, and then in the fifth class one had ancient history again. Those who planned these regulations at that time no longer knew why it was so, and the teachers did not act as if they knew the reasons for it either. But any aware person would have said, When I give history to a boy in the second class, he crams it, but what he takes in needs a few years for it to be at home in his organism. Therefore it is a good thing to give the same things again in the fifth class, for only then does the knowledge that entered his poor head three or four years ago bear its good fruit. <clears throat> the whole structure of the old grammar school was really built up on these things. The monastic schools of the Middle Ages still had many traditions derived from ancient wisdom, a wisdom that is not ours, but one that preserved as an atavism from the ancient past arranges these things logically. In fact, the principle of patience is needed if the life of the head is to pass over into the life of the heart. For while head life unites quickly with us, heart life moves more slowly, it is less active, so we must wait. Today people like to understand everything at once. Just imagine if a person decided to learn something and then had to wait a few years in order to fully understand it. Such a principle can hardly be related to the frame of mind of people today. The feelings of modern people run along very different lines. Let me point out some examples of this. Lately, two plays were produced in Zurich by people connected with the Anthroposophical Society. In fact, it has been widely pointed out that the two people are connected with the building in Dornach, spiritual science, and so on. In this case, to be quite just, it must be acknowledged that two Zurich performances by Pulver and Reinhardt have been really well received in Switzerland. But one can find remarkable things in the correspondence that has gone out of Switzerland. <clears throat> the foreign correspondents have shown themselves, well, less interested, shall we say, than the Swiss audiences themselves. Thus I have had a newspaper given to me in which these first two Swiss performances by Pulver and Reinhardt were discussed. A correspondent cannot resist pointing out that the two authors are connected with our movement and have drawn a great deal from it. Presently, people are not only afraid of the wrong teaching of the Gnosis, as I related yesterday, they are afraid of something concerning the life of the Spirit. If something about world conception creeps into anything, oh, how dreadful! And this actually rests upon the fact that there is no feeling for this relation of head life and heart life. All the life to be found in humanity today outside the head is purely the life of instinct and desire. It is not spiritual. And so the life of instinct and desire is irritated with the mere head life. Head life these days is very spiritual, very intellectual, but it will become more and more contaminated by instincts and desire. Hence thoughts come forth in a curious fashion. And this correspondent of whom I speak, you can perhaps best judge the confusion of his head through his instincts if I read you a characteristic sentence showing his fears that questions about world views come into the plays of the two authors. Just think, the man goes so far as to write, quote, But Pulver's belief in Christ ought to grow out of depths of sorrow and doubt if he wished to win dis disciples from the stage. The star flower plucked by Reinhardt's seeker after paradise at his studio window in the very first scene ought to bloom only at the end and from a bleeding heart. Uh, <clears throat> quote, and now comes the sentence I had in mind. Quote, Both poets' world view was already complete in their heads as they began to write. It would have been better for the dramas if they had to wrestle for their religion as they wrote. Unquote. Now just think of that. Today it is considered a serious fault for someone to have a world conception when sitting down to write. One is supposed to sit down as a perfect fool in face of the world and scribble away, and then in the scribbling at the end a world conception is supposed to spring forth. Then the thing is produced at the theatre and this is supposed to please the audience. Just imagine such stupid nonsense being actually spread abroad in the world today, and many people do not notice that su such rubbish is being circulated. Such things depend simply on the fact that the life of the head is not worked on by the whole being. For, of course, the journalist who wrote that was a very clever man. That should not be disputed. He was very clever. But it is of no possible use to be clever if the cleverness is mere head life. 
That is the important thing to keep in mind. It is extraordinarily important. Here we touch upon something very fundamental, very necessary to our present civilization. One can observe similar things at every turn. Logical slips are not made today because people lack logic, but because logic is not enough. One can be wonderfully logical, pass examinations splendidly, be a brilliant professor of national economy or any other subject, and in spite of being so clever and having any amount of logic to spare, one can nevertheless go off the rails again and again. One will fail to accomplish anything connected with real life if one doesn't have the patience to integrate into one's whole being what is grasped by the head, if one doesn't have the patience to call upon the rejuvenating forces in human life. That is the whole point. Those having anything to do with true science, such as spiritual science, know that they would be ashamed to give a lecture tomorrow on what they found out and learned today because they know that it would be absolutely valueless. Its value would emerge only years afterward. The conscientious spiritual investigator cannot lecture by giving out what has been only just learned, but things must be kept continually present to the soul so that they may ripen. If what has only just been acquired is brought forward, at least special reference should be made to the fact so that the audience may note it. One will really be able to see what the present time needs only if one bears in mind these demands of human nature. For what is necessary for the present age does not lie where people mostly, mostly seek it. It lies in more subtle structures that nevertheless are present everywhere. Without going into politics, here is one example that deserves attention. Many people today, more than is good for the world at any rate, are of the opinion that this war must continue as long as possible so that from it general peace may arise. If it ends too quickly, they say, it does peace no service. I am passing no judgment on the value or lack of value of the so-called peace negotiations between the central powers and Russia, but it has been interesting all the same in the last few days to see what curious kind of logic can be worked out. I have been given an extraordinarily interesting article on this matter. The gentleman in question, his name is of no consequence, argues against a so-called separate peace because he considers that it would not further universal peace a direct way of thinking, but one perhaps that would require one to dig a little deeper, might rather say, <clears throat> well, we might make a certain amount of progress if at least in one spot on earth we stopped mowing each other down. That would be a straightforward way of thinking. A less direct way of thinking comes out as follows. No, one really may not stop fighting in one place, for in that way universal peace would not be promoted. And now the gentleman in question goes on, goes into interesting explanations, that is, explanations that interest him, as to how people quarrel over words. It is his opinion that the people who say, quote, one should be enthusiastic about any peace, even if it is a separate peace, unquote, are hypnotized by words. But one must not be dependent on words. One must go to the core of the matter, and the matter is just this, that a separate peace is harmful to the general peace of the world. Among the various arguments adduced by the gentleman are the following very interesting sentences, most characteristic for the present day. Where shall I begin? I don't want to become too personal. Anyway, as he puts it, quote, Any honest person must admit that this is the motive of many, not all, among us, who so delight in a separate peace and in Lenin and Trotsky. The means, he means that enthusiasm for the word peace is the motive while at the same time tirelessly shouting down the anti-militarists and showing little appreciation for our own Lenins and Trotskys. We, however, who are not duped by words but want to get at the core of the matter, we do not want simply a German peace, but peace. We want general peace. For us the word separate is in contradiction with the word peace. If one takes the article seriously, we are being asked seriously to distinguish between peace and peace. And the article is headed, Peace and Peace. Then the gentleman who spends the whole article excoriating those who worship a word writes the following, quote, For us the word separate stands in contradiction to the word peace. Separation is the principle of strife, not the principle of peace. After this world war we need a world peace in which all nations reach at the same time a great mutual agreement. What we see in Brest-Litovsk 
<clears throat> this game of a select circle of diplomats imbued with all the subtleties of diplomacy, with the naivete, the idealism, and the dogmatism of the representatives of a new order, is a spectacle that can please no one who wishes the ideal to remain pure. It is to be feared that we may get a devil's peace, which will only lead to more frightful war, instead of God's peace, which finally leads to an end to all war. End quote. Well, this is certainly logical, for the article is written with great ingenuity. It is brilliantly ingenious. This article, quote, peace and peace, unquote, is even boldly and courageously written, because it flies in the face of the prejudice of countless people. But its logic is devoid of any connection with reality. For the connection with reality is found only through what we have spoken of, the maturing of knowledge. What the head can experience must be reflected upon in the rest of the person and must mature. It is safe to say that what the very clever people of today lack most of all is this ripening. This lack is connected with the deepest needs and impulses of the present. You see, the present has no inclination at all to study these things. Naturally, I do not mean that every single person can go in for such a study, but people whose métier it is to study ought to occupy themselves with these things, and then the, that would communicate to the rest of the world, excuse me, to the rest of humanity. For isn't it true with all due respect that journalists write what they find to be the general opinion? If, instead of Wilsonianism or some such thing, Islam were to be accepted common opinion, European journalists would write away in the Islamic vein. And if spiritual science had grown into a habit of human souls, then the same journalists who today grumble at spiritual science would write very finely in the sense of spiritual science. Today, however, the very people whose task it should be are disinclined to go into such things. As much as human beings stand here on earth, they are really connected with the whole cosmos. And I have said before that what is true today on earth has not always been true. To mention only the most important points, we shall speak principally now of the period since the great Atlantean flood. Geology calls it the Ice Age. We know that changes took place in humanity at that time. But there had been a humanity before, albeit in a different form. You can read how humans lived then in my title, Occult Science. The Atlantean evolution preceded the present evolution. For instance, where the Atlantic Ocean is now used to be land. A great part of Europe was under the sea. Conditions on earth were quite different during the age of this Atlantean humanity. <clears throat> the ancient Atlantean civilization disappeared. The post-Atlantean has taken its place. But the Atlantean had followed the so-called Lemurian civilization, which in turn had several epochs. Thus we can say that we are in the fifth post-Atlantean civilization, following the first, second, third, and fourth epochs. Before this, there was the Atlantean civilization with its seven epochs. Before this again, the Lemurian civilization with its seven epochs. Let us turn our attention to the seven epochs of the Lemurian civilization, which lies approximately 25,900 years before our era. The seventh epoch of the Lemurian civilization came to an end about 25,000 to 26,000 years ago. Remarkable as it may sound, there is a certain resemblance between this seventh Lemurian epoch and our own. As we know, similarities are always to be found of the most diverse kinds. We have found a close similarity between our epoch and the Egypto-Chaldean epoch. We are now speaking of a much more far-flung similarity. There is, in any case, an external cosmic link. You know that our epoch, which begins about the 15th century of the Christian era, is connected with the cosmos through the fact that since that time the sun has its vernal point in Pisces in the constellation of the fish. Previously, for 2,160 years, the sun had been in the constellation of Aries, the ram, at the vernal equinox. In this seventh Lemurian e epoch there were similar conditions. Twelve epochs ago, the sun was in the same position, so that toward the end of the Lemurian epoch conditions were similar to ours. However, this similarity covers important differences. What we acquire today in the way of inner forces of spirit and intellectual experience, as we have described them in these studies, 
was also experienced by the Lemurian human being, though in a different manner. The Lemurian human was constitutionally very different from the human of today. Whatever could enter from the universe really penetrated right in. The Lemurian received practically the same content of wisdom as the human being of today receives through the head, but it streamed into the Lemurian directly from the universe. This was the only difference. The Lemurian's head was still open, the head still susceptible to the conditions of the cosmos. Powers of clairvoyance existed in those ancient times. Human beings did not explain things logically to themselves. They did not learn them, but they beheld them, since things entered the head straight from the cosmos, whereas now they can no longer do so. <clears throat> For now what comes in can enter the head directly only in early childhood. As I have said, the head no longer stands in such intimate connection with the cosmos, whereas at that time the human head stood in much more inward relation to the universe. At that time the human being still received world wisdom. This does not mean that it lacked the logic, which is nevertheless lacking in what humans gain for themselves nowadays. That original wisdom was actually inspired. It came to the human from without, arising from divine worlds. Present-day humans are unwilling to consider this. For modern people believe, forgive me again if I express myself somewhat drastically, that ever since they have been on earth their skull has been as hard as it is today. This is not true. The head has closed only relatively recently. In ancient times it was responsive to the streams of cosmic influences. By now all that is left is an atavistic remainder. Everyone who has observed a really young child's head has noted there is still one soft place. This is the last relic of that openness to the cosmos, the place where in ancient times cosmic forces worked in a certain way into the head and gave cosmic wisdom. <clears throat> At that time human beings did not need the correspondence with the heart, for they had a small heart in the head that has become shriveled and rudimentary by now. Thus do human beings change. But conditions alter over the earth, and humans must understand this and change too, adapt themselves to changed conditions. If our head had not ossified, we would have been perpetually tied to the apron strings of the cosmos. As it is, we have been shut off from the cosmos and can develop an independent ego. It is important to bear this in mind. We can develop an independent ego by reason of having acquired physically this hard skull. We may ask when humanity actually lost the last remnant of the memories, the living memories of ancient archetypal wisdom. This remnant really faded away only in the epoch preceding ours, the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, that of the Greco-Roman civilization. By then humans had long since possessed closed skulls, but the mysteries still preserved the original wisdom preserved from quite ancient times, from the epoch that preceded the Lemurian Pisces Age, the Lemurian Ares Age, Ares Age. Whatever ego Lemurian humans could have was also revealed from the cosmos. The individual's inmost soul force was manifested from the cosmos. This ended in the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, the Greco-Latin time. The heavens closed their last door to human beings. Instead, they sent down their great messenger, precisely at that time, so that humans could find on earth what until then was received from heaven. The Christ, the mystery of Golgotha, is a cosmic fact, insofar as, without it, there would have ceased for humanity what has been revealed from the heavens, cosmically revealed since the Lemurian time. <clears throat> Therefore, the impulse which can reveal cosmic wisdom on the earth appeared. Now the human being must gradually develop what has been revealed on earth in the Christ impulse, develop it precisely by that process of rejuvenation of which we have been speaking. A result of this human development is that we bear something within us today that is, one can say, quite wonderful. I have already mentioned in yesterday's lecture that the knowledge of our time is the most spiritual possible. However, human beings do not notice it because they do not let it mature. What can be known today about nature is far more spiritual than was ever formerly known. What humans knew before brought down certain realities from the cosmos. 
In the stars, as I mentioned yesterday, the scholastics of the Middle Ages still saw angelic intelligences. Modern mathematics no longer sees angelic intelligences, of course, but something that can be calculated mathematically or mechanically. But it is as if what used to be seen has been sifted, thoroughly passed through the finest sieve, down to the last trace of spirituality. Actually, Novalis's lovable genius was needed to see this rightly. In his title, Aphorisms, you find the beautiful expression which I have often quoted, quote, Mathematics is in truth a great poem, unquote. But to see how mathematics, by which one also calculates the worlds of the stars and their courses, can be a great poem, one must be a poet oneself, not like the modern natural scientists, but a poet like Novalis. Then one stands in awe before the poetry of mathematics. For mathematics is fantasy. Mathematics is nothing observable through the senses. It is fantasy. It is, however, the final product of a fantasy that still is connected with the immediate external reality. Mathematics, in fact, is maya passed through the finest of sieves. And if one learns to know it, not merely the way today's schoolmasters see it, but to know it in its substance, by what it can reveal, then indeed one learns to know something that has as little reality as the image we see in the mirror placed in front of us, but which nevertheless in certain circumstances can tell us a great deal. But to be sure, only a fool would consider the image in the mirror final reality. And if one wants to hold a conversation with the reflection because one confuses it with reality, then one is not looking for reality in the right place. Equally as little can reality be found in the astronomer's mathematical calculations. Just as the mirror image cannot exist without the reality, so the whole spiritual existence, as calculated purely mathematically, is not really there. It is completely sifted, distilled, and must force its way back to reality. Precisely because our age has become so abstract, because it has been shaped so purely by the head, It has immense spiritual content. And nothing is quite as purely spiritual as the science of the present. Only people do not know or value that fact. At any rate, it is almost ridiculous to be materialistic with modern science. It is actually rather strange to go through life taking modern science materialistically. Yet almost all scholars do take it thus. Given the kind of concepts that modern science can develop, It is comical to assert that there is only material existence, for if there really were only matter, it would not be possible to assert that there was material existence. The very fact of making the statement, matter exists, this action of the soul, is the finest spirituality possible. It is proof in itself that there is more than material existence. One can assert all kinds of things, but if one really assumes that existence is purely material, One can never assert that there is a material existence. The very assertion is itself proof that one is talking nonsense. For if, as the materialist claims, there were truly only material existence, nothing could ever arise out of that material existence which would result in any way in someone saying matter exists. For this very saying is a spiritual process. As you can see, no better logical proof has ever been provided for the world being of the Spirit than is being provided by the science of our time, which does not believe in the Spirit, which means it does not believe in itself, and by our whole age, which does not believe in itself. Only because humanity has spiritualized itself increasingly from epoch to epoch and has arrived at the sharply refined concepts that we have today, Only because of this has humanity reached the point of seeing the finely sifted concepts and of its own volition connecting them with the forces of the heart. This is shown very clearly by concrete life. It is shown also by the catastrophic events of our time. If one really studies history, one sees an enormous difference between what we now call the world war, which is really no war at all but something else, and earlier wars. People do not yet pay any attention to these things, but the distinction is already plain to see in everything that is going on. One could bring up many proofs that this is the case, but many people speak very unclearly while using a quite particular acuity 
like the man from whose article I read an extract. And this contemporary mental acuity is what gets people to say time and time again things like, the war must be prolonged as long as possible so that the best possible peace can be established. No one would have said things like that in earlier wars, and in many other respects no one would have spoken the way people speak today. As I said earlier, people do not notice it yet, but it is true nevertheless. If you take all earlier wars, you will find that fundamentally, in some way or another, people were able to say why they were waging war. I will give two examples only, although hundreds are available. People before wanted something to be definite, clearly outlined, described. Can people today do this? And if they can, do they do it? Many of those heavily involved in the war do not do it. No one knows what really lies behind things. And if people say that they want this or that, they formulate it in such a way that the other side has no real idea what they want. That was certainly not the case in earlier wars. You could go through the whole of world history and not find anything like it. You can take such grievous events in earlier times as, say, the invasions of Europe by the Tartars, the Mongols, and you will always find that there were quite definite goals which could be sharply defined, which could be understood, and from which one could understand what was really happening. Where today is there a clear definition of what is actually going on? This is one thing, but now something else. What was generally the result of earlier wars? Look wherever you will and you will find that they resulted in some ter territorial change which people then accepted. How do people face these things today? They all explain that there must be no territorial change. So one must ask oneself, what was the whole thing for? Compared with the past, this is really where things stand. People cannot fight for the things they always fought for, for that is simply not done. The moment something is supposed to happen, someone instantly declares, that simply cannot be done. Thus, according to the prevailing impulses, no real peace is possible. For if one were to leave everything as it was before, there was no need to begin the war in the first place. But since one has begun and nevertheless wants to leave everything as it was before, one naturally can't leave off, for otherwise there would have been no need to begin. These things are abstract and paradoxical, but they correspond to profound realities. They correspond to conditions that ought to be kept in mind at the present time. One must in fact say that what is discussed here as the lack of correspondence between head human and heart human is a world historical fact. On the other hand, one can also say that humanity is in a quite particular stage of development. Human beings cannot control their thoughts in a human way. That is the most significant characteristic of our time. Human beings cannot humanly control their thoughts. All has changed and people are not yet willing to notice that it has. Thus we are concerned not merely with something that has to do with world conceptions, but something that very deeply affects the most widespread event of our time, the most crushing event for humanity. People no longer find out from their own souls the connection with their own thoughts. And this shows us how not only the individual, but humanity as a whole, has forgotten how to mobilize the rejuvenating forces. Humanity will not easily extricate itself from this condition. It can do so only if we believe in the rejuvenating forces and if we can get rid of those things that cannot be rejuvenated. Whether we look at individuals or at our surroundings, we find everywhere the same thing. We find a sifted head wisdom, head experience, without the will to let things ripen through the heart's experience. This, however, is so deeply linked with the needs of the common evolution of humanity that we must turn our closest attention to it for the present and immediate future. <clears throat> we have indeed often spoken of it previously from the most varied points of view. Precisely this state of things shows how necessary it is for spiritual science to enter the world today, even as something abstract. But spiritual science is fruitful. It can reform the world because it can send its impulse into actual concrete conditions of life. Humanity faces a sad future if people no longer have faith in becoming older, if they want to stop short at what can be experienced by the short-lived head. I have said already that the utmost that can be attained by the short-lived head is abstract socialism, unrelated to concrete conditions. 
Yet this is really the only thing people believe in. Philosophers are constantly telling us nothing exists but matter due to the philosopher's own finely tuned spirituality. Of course, they should never give up that judgment at once, for it is pure nonsense. Excuse me, let me say that again. Of course, they should better give up that judgment at once, for it is pure nonsense. The mainspring of the present so-called war is to be found in general world conditions from which there is no way out, just as there is no way out from the sentence, quote, there is only matter, unquote. For the present time, it is fact, it is in fact of the spirit. And the, let me read that again. For the present time, it is in fact of the spirit, and the spiritual element in this time needs condensing, strengthening, so that it can affect reality. Otherwise, it will remain a mirror image. The way humanity works today is as if we didn't want to work in a workshop with real men and women, instead believing it possible to work in a workshop with mirror images of men and women. That is true of the most extreme form of cerebral socialism, which is what makes it so illuminating for great masses of people, since it is all logical, intellectual experience, purely logical head experience. But if this logical head experience cannot meet the spiritual element in the other person, what then can it meet? I have repeatedly spoken of that, and again today. It unites with the blind desires and instincts. Then an impure mixture results between the head experience, which is really quite spiritual, and the blind instincts and desires. That union is what some are now trying to achieve in the East. The purely cerebral socialist theory has nothing to do with the actual concrete conditions of the East. What men like Lenin and Trotsky have devised has nothing to do with what is developing out of concrete necessity in the East. If through some peculiar chain of circumstances Lenin and Trotsky had landed in Australia instead of Russia, they would have thought they could introduce the same conditions that they wished to introduce in Russia. The conditions fit Australia or South America just as much or as little as they do Russia. They would fit just as well on the moon, since they fit no real concrete conditions. Why? Because they come from the head, and the head is not of the earth. <clears throat> Perhaps they really would fit better on the moon, since they are purely of the head. That they are intelligible comes from the fact that they are closely related to the head. But here on earth such things must be established as are related to the earth. We must find a spirituality which is connected with the earth's future in the way we described yesterday. This leads us into deep and significant matters, and when we consider them we will see how little inclined people today really are to go into these matters, yet they are as necessary as daily bread. Otherwise, if we cannot find the path to rejuvenation, the evolution of humanity will lead either to the pit or to a blind alley.